Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen O'Shaughnessy, and I'm a lecturer from the Technological University in Dublin. And on behalf of my colleague, Frank Breitinger from the University of Lausanne and myself, I am presenting our paper entitled Malware Family Classification via Efficient Huffman Features. So to give you an idea of what this paper is about, um, Efficient Huffman Features, or EHF, is essentially an algorithm based on compression. Um, the idea was to produce a machine learning ready feature set without the need for any kind of manually intensive pre-processing uh, feature extraction and feature um, generation uh, steps. So to give you some background issues that I suppose motivated this study, well, malware is constantly on the rise. It's hardly breaking news, but um, what is interesting is that malware, the new malware that we're seeing um, is generally kind of staying stable, whereas the variants of these original strains are constantly rising at an almost exponential rate. Um, the classification of these variants is, um, is, is important in order to kind of group them into their correct kind of, I suppose, taxonomic class um, based on similar traits and behaviors. The, the problem with that is malware is essentially a binary file. So these traits and behaviors that we can extract are not readily available. So we need to have, you know, we, we normally need to use some sort of um, pre-processing stage or pre-analysis stage uh, to extract features. Um, generally, these feature extraction approaches are quite labor intensive. They can be invasive. So for example, uh, using reverse engineering or disassembly. Um, and so may not scale well to large data sets. Additionally, then, they require knowledge of the malware's internal binary structure because we need to know the internal binary structure in order to know where that interesting information is. Um, on top of that, then, feature selection, which is the, you know, once, we, once we've gathered or extracted the, the features, we also need to be able to select the correct features for classification. Because if we select incorrect features, then the classifier will, you know, learn incorrect traits that will throw off its, its predictive um, capabilities. Um, the problem is, by and large, malware analysts are not data scientists. And so the, the choosing or the selection of the correct feature sets can be quite challenging. Um, so the motivation for this was to produce uh, almost an automated solution whereby we didn't have to have any um, feature extraction or um, feature selection um, processes before we actually got the data into a state that we could use it for um, machine learning classification. So I first looked into compression. So if you're thinking of the likes of 7-zip or WinZip or BZip, you'd be correct. Um, so in terms of what, what, a, what a compression algorithm does, well, essentially encodes data into it reduced representation of, of fewer bits, um, usually for reduced storage or for reduced bandwidth if it's been, trans been transmitted over a wire. Um, for our purposes, um, we can think of compression as representing our data um, or our files with less data. So essentially a subset of the original data. Um, the advantage of compression as well is that can be employed to data in any format. So this has the potential to be used in a wide variety of domains. So it's not just limited to malware classification. In terms of what's been done before and for compression, um, mainly, the, mainly the works of concentrating on distance metrics. So the main one being normalized compression distance or NCD. Um, this has been shown uh, to be used in a wide variety of domains, like test, text classification, um, uh, genomics, uh, virology, um, even music classification. Um, so it's found to be an, an effective metric. Um, the LZJD and Schwell algorithms um, were based on the lembel ziv uh, compression algorithm, and also were shown to be effective um, in, particularly in the malware classification space. Um, in terms of compression as a feature space, 
there has been work done to show that the dictionary is produced by some of the algorithms, such as the lempel um variants, um, can be engineered as feature vectors. And that was the case with the likes of LZJD and Schwell. Um, the authors did use, um, they use min hashing and feature hashing in order to um, convert or engineer those uh, substrings into features that could be used for classification. Um, we've seen the LZ algorithm being used for text classification problems as well. Um, some of the limitations with these approaches though, in particular NCD is computationally inefficient. So to calculate the similarity between in two input sequences, we need to calculate three compression um, processes. So we need to compress not only the input uh, strings or input um, sequences A and B, but also the concatenation of A and B as well. So essentially you have three compression operations um, per um, similarity metric uh, measurement. Um, and so this becomes infeasible for, for large data sets. The LZ variants um, have been shown to produce very large feature spaces. So for example, the LZ variant LZ77 produces a, a, an exponential feature space. So as our data inputs grow, so the number of our files that we're processing grows, so too does the feature space to represent those. And again, the likes of the, the LZJD and Schwell algorithms, um, the authors have had to use feature dimension reduction um, in order to make this kind of feasible as, as a kind of a, a feature space. Um, I, I kind of highlight the LZJD and Schwell algorithm because although they are essentially a distance type metric, they do produce a, a set, um, a feature set based on the LZ algorithm that is essentially a, a feature vector. Um, and so in some ways then are similar to the EHF algorithm that we produced. Um, so based on the findings there, I wanted to find a, an algorithm that was efficient and produced a, a small feature space. So I settled on Huffman coding, um, essentially just because of the way the algorithm works. So it's based on the frequencies of occurrences of um, the, the input symbols, which are essentially the characters within the, uh, the input sequences. So the input sequence in our case is a, a malware binary. So if you think of it, we're representing, um, to say, say the extended uh, ASCII set. So the, 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 the maximum amount of, of characters or symbols within our alphabet is 256. Um, so that equates to essentially the, the, maximum, um, the maximum feature size or feature dimension uh, size of our vector um, is going to be 256, which is markedly smaller than um, the likes of DLZ uh, algorithms. So just to give an idea of how um, Hoffman works, um, Essentially what it does, it generates a, a binary tree um, based on the frequencies of occurrence of the, the characters, uh, such that the, the tree produced um, the lower nodes on the tree or the, the, the end nodes on the tree will be the input uh, symbols with the lowest frequencies, so the lowest frequency of occurrence, whereas at the top of the tree, the, um, the symbols with the highest frequencies um, we will tend to be. Um, so to give an example of how it actually works, of a simple string there of 22 uh, symbols, 22 characters, A, B, and C. So we first of all start off by calculating the frequencies of each. So we've got four A's, six C's, and 12 B's. Um, the iteration of the algorithm works by removing the first two lowest frequencies from the set and adding it to uh, a subtree or creating a sorry subtree, um, the parent node uh, being the summation of the uh, the weights of or the frequencies of the two child nodes. So, for instance, our example A is four um, and B C is six. Um, so, the parent node is going to be ten, um, and that's added back then into the set, and then that process is repeated until we get a full binary tree and we essentially only have one node left in our set. Um, the actual uh, Hoffman code word, which is essentially the representation for the, uh, 
the symbol or the character um, is obtained by following the edges from the, uh, the root down to the, where the node is on the tree. And um, using the, I should have said that the, as, as the tree is constructed, we, the convention is that we add a zero to the left-hand child and a one to the right-hand child. Um, and these are used then as the, as the, binary, uh, the binary code word as we construct it. So if you look at our example, um, A, the Huffman code word um, is obtained by following the root um, node down to, to, down to A, so that's zero, zero. Um, C is zero, one, and B is one. So instead of representing, say, for example, each symbol uh, in terms of eight bits, um, which would be 22 by eight, which would be 176 bits, we can now represent A with two bits, C with two bits, and B with one bit, which works out four by two, six by two, plus 12 by one, which is 32 bits. So that's essentially how the, the Huffman coding algorithm works. Um, the EHF algorithm is a kind of, a, I suppose, an extension of that. So it it calculates the code words in, in the same way as before. Um, but what it does at the end then is it combines the, the symbol and um, which is converted to its decimal equivalent and um, the integer value of the code word, the binary code word, and then also the frequency itself. So I initially, I just used the, the Huffman code word as, um, as the feature um, for classification, but I found that the, uh, the models that were produced weren't, didn't generalize well. So they weren't robust against kind of unseen, um, unseen samples. And so I kind of went back to the drawing board and I said, well, you know, if you look at what we're producing here, um, the symbol itself can be represented as a number, um, which is important obviously because we're dealing with, you know, individual unique symbols and um, it's frequency. And um, so if a, malware sample is almost the same, um, two variants sorry, are, are almost the same, then they will share the same uh, symbols. They will share more or less the same frequency of symbols as well. And the code words will be quite similar as well. So I combined those three values into a composite um, feature um, and used that then to represent each symbol. So essentially the, the, the output from the EHF algorithm is a a vector. So the dimensions of the vector depends on the input of uh, the input of the characters or the symbols within the within the data. So, like I said, the maximum size or the maximum dimension is two five six. Um, I suppose just to note that because we're dealing with variants of of um, binary files, there may be some alphabetic uh, symbols missing um, or not present in in, in certain uh, files. And so the EHF algorithm may produce variable length vectors. So for classification, we need to have a uniform sized vector. So the dimensions need to be the same for, for classification. And so to kind of get around this, I resized all of the, the vectors to the K kind of smallest dimension vector. So for example, the, the smallest dimension vector um, in the, the data set that I use for the experiments was 229. So I reduced all of the other vectors in the set to 229 dimensions. So the way that the, the Hoffman algorithm works, it's sorted based on, on code words. So the, the least kind of frequent code words or the least frequent symbols will be towards the end of the, of the, the set. So any features that I've trimmed off will tend to be the lesser frequent um, symbols within the input sequence. So we'll have kind of a less of an impact on the actual overall kind of classification of the, um, of the malware. So the data that we used was um, primarily the Win32 portable executable files. So P files, which are essentially, you know, the kind of the most common uh, type of format that we can find malware in. Um, these were extracted from uh, several repositories on the first total academic share from around 2018 up to 2021. I used a, an open source tool called AV Class Labeler, um, which enabled me to cluster the, the malware together and um, based on family class. And um, so it uses the output from, from the, uh, the worst total um, AV scanners um, to label the malwares according to, to their family. 
Uh, initially, I used a training set of around 8,000 samples from 12 families. Um, the reason why I've extended that then for further testing is because we just decided that we needed just to test how well the models generalized onto, onto kind of different and more families. So I extended it up to around 14,500 uh, from 23 families for kind of the latter stages of, of the, uh, the testing. And in terms of the classification, then once we had the data into the feature sets and the data and the labels were split in a 90 10. So 90 being the, the training and testing and 10% then was held back then for evaluation, for evaluating the models on unseen data. I primarily chose K nearest neighbor uh, as the algorithm because it's a distance based metric. And some of the experiments that I, I was conducting were um, based on, on NCD. So I wanted to be able to interchange the, um, the distance metrics easy enough, which I could do with K-nearest neighbor in order to kind of evaluate it against um, the NCD um, algorithm. So I use parameter tuning to uh, find the best or optimum parameters for the, uh, for the, the KNN classifier. And I also use uh, fivefold uh, cross-validation in order to kind of reduce kind of overfitting and classification errors. Um, the metrics used are precision recall and accuracy, um, just because accuracy alone, I don't think, which, which was found in most cases in previous works, um, doesn't give a kind of a good overall picture. So precision, precision recall um, will obviously give a better in, in indicator of how the models performed. So the results on the initial training set were, were, were good. Um, 11 out of the 12 families uh, were predicted with a TPR rate of 97% or above. And um, one family in particular um, performed kind of markedly poorer, which was the SCAR family. Um, I did some further digging on that. And the, the two classes that it was kind of mis misclassified as um, being Autowit and um, Viltel. Um, when I checked out, I, I ran them through the worst total uh, API. And uh, it was found that in, in, in many cases there was kind of mislabeling or, or you know, SCAR would be mislabeled as, as Autowit, say, for instance, in some cases. So that could be, you know, the, the reason why for, for that mislabeling. Um, once the models were created, the 10% evaluation set returned um, pretty good uh, results as well in around 97% for, for the three um, classification metrics that were used. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to run a comparison with NCD, even though NCD is primarily a distance metric, I wanted to show that um, EHF could be used in conjunction with a standard uh, distance metric in order to, um, you know, produce a kind of a, a, an efficient way of um, similarity uh, comparisons. And so the table there shows the, the, the runtime for the comparisons for uh, each data point or each kind of feature essentially in, um, in the feature set. So you can see that the, the Minkowski EHF um, algorithm uh, ran at a, roughly around one millisecond per comparison, as opposed to 1.2 seconds and with NCD, which is pretty much three orders of magnitude slower. Um, likewise, the Minkowski EHF algorithm outperformed NCD by roughly around 20% as well. Um, so that just proved that, you know, um, EHF, along with some standard um, distance metric, is, is a viable method for kind of similarity uh, measurements uh, for, for malware. Um, I compared and evaluated uh, EHF against LZJD simply because, again, the, I suppose, the LZ sets that were produced from both algorithms and we're essentially feature sets for that could be used for classification. And I wanted to show kind of a similar kind of method and again, evaluate how well EHF would compare to those. So in terms of feature generation times, um, EHF had an average of around 50, 50 milliseconds as opposed to 120 with LZJD. And LZJD uh, Schwell algorithm uh, was around 500 milliseconds, which is obviously 10 times uh, slower than, than EHF. Um, in terms of training time, then again, the, uh, the uh, sorry, EHF was roughly around 
three times faster than the LZJD Schwell algorithm, um, and roughly probably around seven times faster than the LZJD. LZJD. Um, a lot of that is obviously down to the feature dimension size as well, because the feature dimension size for both LZJD variants is 1024, as opposed to EHF, which had um, a feature dimension size of, of uh, 229. The second comparison then with LZJD was for uh, classification performance. So this was on the larger uh, virus total data set of um, the 15 and a half thousand samples. Um, so the, the Schwell algorithm performed slightly better um, than EHF, roughly around 0.1 to 0.4% um, over the three um, over the three metrics, precision, recall, and accuracy. Um, but in terms of the validation on the 10% data set, um, EHF performed, um, outperformed um, both LZGD variants um, quite considerably. Now, just to put in a, a note there that um, I didn't do any kind of, um, I suppose, you know, parameter tuning or um, dimension reduction or anything like that in, in terms of the LZGD. So if we did spend a bit more time on that, you know, the results might have been different in terms of performance for the LZGD. But again, this was used in, you know, to evaluate the EHF as a kind of a viable method, I suppose, of, of, uh, of classification for, for, for malware. The last set of tests I did was on code uh, reordering. So I used an import table uh, the import tables extracted from the, the virus total uh, data set. Um, they were trained on the classifier as before. Um, and then I used the tool to basically reorder the, the, the code and as uh, such so reorder the, the, um, the import tables. The import tables were extracted from the subsample then, and then were run against the KN model, which produced an accuracy of roughly around 100%, very, very high um, recall precision and accuracy. The, the reason why um, I, I conducted this experiment and this, this set of tests was just to show that the, the way EHF works and the way Huffman works is because it works on the frequency of occurrence of, of symbols, um, the, the order in which the data is input doesn't matter. So if two files are the same, if they're reordered in any way, then the sets produced from um, the EHF algorithm should be the same because the alphabet, alphabetic symbols will be the same, the frequencies will be the same and so on. Um, and so, you know, that, that was this, this test was essentially to, to kind of show that. In terms of feature op optimization, I played around with, with the number of features just to see um, its effect on classification error. Um, so the example I have here, I reduced the dimensions of the VT set down from 229 to 250, which is, um, approximately from 105 to around 85, which is approximately 20% of, of a less uh, compute time, which you can see on the, the, the right-hand side. And then if you look at the corresponding um, error rate, it increased only by 0 0.4. So the significance of this is if, if we want to run this at scale and we have a, a large scale data set, then we may want to optimize um, the uh, algorithm by lowering the features. Um, and, you know, if we can afford a slight trade-off um, of, of an increase of, of a, a, an error classification error, then, you know, we can greatly optimize the, the algorithm uh, at scale. Um, again, this is dependent on the data, so I don't have any information on, on other data sets, but for this particular data set, roughly, you know, dropping the, the features down to 150 only had an increase of 0.4. So just to give a summary of the contributions of, of this paper, um, we've produced a, an algorithm called EHF, which is based on compression, um, which negates the need for any kind of invasive pre-processing um, and gives a set of features that are ready for machine learning. Um, it's quite fast. It's built on Python. It can be improved. Um, but at the moment, it's built on, on, on a heap structure, which is quite fast. Um, and so is scalable to, to large, uh, large data sets. 
it's free and open source. So on the paper, I do provide a link to the um, to the repository. Um, it has the potential to deploy to other domains because it's based on compression. We can compress pretty much any file. Um, so it has the, the potential there um, to be used to, um, you know, to be used in other domains, not just malware classification. And the outputs then are in such a way, in such a format, essentially that they're ready to be plugged into um, machine learning algorithms. Um, you know, they're essentially a feature set that represent the malware binaries um, and that we can just pass to any machine learning algorithm there. Some of the limitations, EHF is, is I suppose, in its infancy. I only developed it in January. Um, and as such, we, I suppose, we developed the tests um, uh, and subsequently, I suppose, wrote the tests around the paper because um, when I spoke to Frank about this in January, we decided that we wanted to put it into this conference and obviously we had a short deadline. Um, and so we designed the experiments to fit into the paper in, in the short space time that we had. Um, so um, there obviously are limitations there that, that you know, we, we can address. Um, we limited the malware uh, experiments to executables and import uh, table dumps. Um, but like I said, we, we could probably implement this in any type of, of data type um, or data format. Um, I only use the KNN classifier. Again, I use it out of convenience because it's, it's a distance-based classifier and I could easily interchange the, um, the, the, the distance metrics to have a, a comparison or evaluation against the, uh, the NCD um, algorithm. And then obviously, you know, there is lots of other obfuscation um, methods such as packing and encryption um, that weren't tested. Um, again, this is down to down to time, and obviously that's something that we could we would um, explore further. So, in terms of future work to test at scale, um, at the moment I, I've I've unsuccessfully tried to download Sorel uh, dataset, which is it's eight terabytes, and um, I've managed to, to download uh, two and a half terabytes before, and um, the connection seemed to just crap out. I don't know why. Um, so hopefully. Over the summer, I'll get I'll get to download the whole data set and work on that. Um, we'd like to improve the process and speeds, obviously, because um, you know if we're looking at large scale um, processing, we need to have something you know faster. So we could use a maybe a different language or use maybe C bindings in, in Python um, to, to do that. Um, could be applied to other forensic scenarios. So one that comes to mind would be say file fragment identification. Um, and again, you know, because we're dealing with, with uh, compression, that is a possibility. And then obviously the further obfuscation test and the test on the likes of packing or encryption and see if EHF can pick up, um, you know, any of those uh, kind of obfuscated um, samples that are within a data set. Okay, so that concludes um, my, my talk. I just want to thank the organizers for the Digital Forensic Research Workshop for um, allowing us to present today and I'll, um, I'll answer any questions that you may have now. Thank you.